Chapter 15, The Ferment of Reform and Culture, 1790 to 1860. Those of you who've been reading the American pageant along, you will notice the dates are the same as chapters 13 and 14. Chapter 13 was a political history. Chapter 14 was more of an economic history. And chapter 15 will be a social and cultural history of this time period. A third revolution accompanied the reformation of American politics and the transformation of the American economy in the mid-19th century. This was a diffuse yet deeply felt commitment to improve the character of ordinary Americans, to make them more upstanding, God-fearing, and literate. Some high-minded souls were disillusioned by the rough-and-tumble realities of democratic politics. Others, notably women, were excluded from the political game altogether. As the young republic grew, increasing numbers of Americans poured their considerable energies into religious revivals and reform movements. Reform campaigns of all types flourished in sometimes bewildering abundance. There was not a reading man who was without some scheme for a new utopia in his waistcoat pocket, in his waistcoat pocket, claimed Ralph Waldo Emerson. Reformers promoted better public schools and rights for women, as well as miracle medicines, polygamy, celibacy, rule by prophets, and guides by spirits. Societies were formed against alcohol, tobacco, profanity, and the transit of mail on the Sabbath. Eventually, overshadowing all other reforms was the great crusade against slavery. Many reformers drew their crusading zeal from religion. Beginning in the late 1790s, a boiling over into the early 19th century, the Second Great Awakening swept through America's Protestant churches, transforming the place of religion in American life and sending a generation of believers out on their missions to perfect the world. Reviving Religion Church attendance was still a regular ritual for about three-fourths of the 23 million Americans in 1850. Alexis de Tocqueville declared that there was no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. Yet the religion of these years was not the old-time religion of colonial days. The austere, Calvinist rigor had long been seeping out of the American churches. The rationalist ideas of the, of the French Revolutionary era had done much to soften the older orthodoxy. Thomas Paine's widely circulated book, The Age of Reason, had shockingly declared that all churches were, quote, set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. American anti-clericalism was seldom that virulent, but many of the founding fathers, including Jefferson and Franklin, embraced the liberal doctrines of deism that Paine promoted. Deists relied on reason rather than revelation, on science rather than the Bible. They rejected the concept of original sin and denied Christ's divinity. Yet Deus believed in a supreme being who had created a noble universe and endowed human beings with a capacity for moral behavior. Deism helped to inspire an important spin-off from the severe Puritanism of the past, the Unitarian faith, which began to gather momentum in New England at the end of the 18th century. Unitarians held that God existed in only one person, hence Unitarian, and not in the Orthodoxy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Although denying the deity of Jesus, Unitarians stressed the essential goodness of human nature rather than its vileness. They proclaimed their belief in free will and the possibility of salvation through good works. They pictured God not as a stern creator, but as a loving father. Embraced by many leading thinkers, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, the Unitarian movement appealed mostly to intellectuals whose rationalism and optimism contrasted sharply with the hellfire doctrines of Calvinism, especially predestination and human depravity. A boiling reaction against the growing liberalism in religion set about in 1800, a fresh wave of roaring revivals beginning in the southern frontier but soon rolling even into the cities of northern, the northeast sent the Second Great Awakening surging across the land. Sweeping up even more more people than the First Great Awakening, almost a century earlier, the Second Great Awakening was one of the most momentous episodes in the history of American religion. This tidal wave of spiritual fervor left in its wake countless converted souls, many scattered and reorganized churches, and numerous new sects. It also encouraged an effervescent evangelicalism that bubbled up in the innumerable areas of American life, including prison reform, the temperance cause, women's movement, and the crusade to abolish slavery. The Second Great Awakening was spread to the masses on the frontier by huge camp meetings. As, as many as 25,000 people would gather for an encampment of several days to drink the hellfire gospel as served up by an itinerant preacher, thousands of spiritually starved souls got religion at as, as these gatherings and in their ecstasy engaged in frenzies of rolling, 
dancing, barking, and jerking. Many of the saved soon backslid into their former sinful ways, but the revivals boosted church membership and stimulated a variety of humanitarian reforms. Responsive Easterners were moved to do missionary work in the West with Indians, in Hawaii, and in Asia. Methodists and Baptists reap the most abundant harvest of souls from the fields fertilized by revivalism. Both texts stressed personal conversion, contrary to predestination, and a relatively democratic control of church affairs, and a rousing emotionalism. As a frontier jingle ran, the devil hates the Methodists because they sing and shout the best. Powerful Peter Cartwright was the best known of the Methodist circuit riders or traveling frontier preachers. This ill-educated but sinewy servant of the Lord reigned for a half a century from Tennessee to Illinois, calling upon sinners to repent. With bellowing voice and flailing arms, he converted thousands of souls to the Lord. Not only did he lash the devil with his tongue, but with his fists he knocked out rowdies who tried to break up his meetings. His Christianity was definitely muscular. Bell-voiced Charles Grandison Finney was the greatest of the revival preachers. Trained as a lawyer, Finney abandoned the bar to become an evangelicalist, I'm sorry, evangelist uh, after a deeply moving conversion experience as a young man. Tall and athletically built, Finney draw huge crowds spellbound with the power of his oratory and the pungency of his message. He led massive revivals in Rochester and New York City in 1830 and 1831. Finney preached a version of the old-time religion, but he was also an innovator. He devised the anxious bench, where repentant sinners could sit in full view of the congregation, and he encouraged women to pray out loud in public. Holding out the promise of a perfect Christian kingdom on earth, Finney denounced both alcohol and slavery. He eventually served as president of Oberlin College in Ohio, which he helped make a hotbed of revivalist activity and abolitionism. A key feature of the Second Great Awakening was the feminization of religion, both in terms of church membership and theology. Middle-class women, the wives and daughters of businessmen, were the first and most fervent enthusiasts of religious revivalism. They made up the majority of the new church members, and they were most likely to stay within the fold once the tents were packed up and the traveling evangelists left town. Perhaps women's greatest ambivalence, uh, that perhaps women's greater ambivalence than men about the changes wrought by the expanding market economy made them such eager converts to piety. It helped as well that evangelicals preached a gospel of female spiritual worth and offered women an active role in bringing their husbands and families back to God. That accomplished, many women turned to saving the rest of society. They formed a host of benevolent and charitable organizations and spearheaded crusades for most, if not all, of the era's ambitious reforms. So, very big role for women in this another sphere where women can play an active role in society. Denominational diversity. Revivals also furthered the fragmentation of religious faiths. Western New York, where many descendants of New England Puritans had settled, was so blistered by sermonizers preaching hellfire and damnation that it became known as the Burnt Over District. Millerites, or Adventists, who mustered several hundred thousand adherents, rose from the superheated soil of the Burnt Over region in the 1830s. Named after the eloquent and commanding William Miller, they interrupted the Bible to they interpreted the Bible to mean that Christ would return to earth on October 22, 1844. Donning their go-to-meeting clothes, they gathered in prayerful assemblies to greet their Redeemer. The failure of Jesus to descend on schedule dampened, but did not destroy the movement. Like the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening tended to widen the lines between classes and religions and regions. The more prosperous and conservative denominations in the East were little touched by revivalism, and Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Unitarians continued to rise mostly from the wealthier, better educated levels of society. Methodists, Baptists, and the members of the other new sects spawned by the swelling evangelicalist fervor tended to come from the less prosperous, less learned communities in the rural South and West. Religious diversity further reflected social cleavages when the church faced up to the slavery issue. By 1844 and 1845, both the Southern Baptists and the Southern Methodists had split with their Northern brethren over human bondage. The Methodists came to grief over the case of a slave-owning bishop in Georgia, whose second wife added several household slaves to his estate. In 1857, the Presbyterians, North and South, parted company. The secession of the Southern churches foreshadowed the secession of the Southern states. First the churches split, then political parties split, and then the Union split. A desert Zion in Utah. 
The smoldering spiritual embers of the Burnt Dover district kindled one especially ardent flame in 1830. In that year, Joseph Smith, a rugged visionary, proud of his prowess at wrestling, reported that he had received some golden plates from an angel. When deciphered, they constituted the Book of Mormon, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormons, was launched. It was a Native American product, a new religion, destined to spread its influence worldwide. That is, Native American, not from Europe, not Native Americans. After establishing a religious oligarchy, Smith ran into serious opposition from his non-Mormon neighbors first in Ohio, and then in Missouri, and then Illinois. His cooperative sect rasped rank-and-file Americans who were individualistic and dedicated to free enterprise. The Mormons aroused further antagonism by voting as a unit, and by openly but understandably drilling their militia for defensive purposes. Accusations of polygamy likewise arose and increased in intensity, for Joseph Smith was reputed to have several wives. Continuing hostility finally drove the Mormons to desperate measures, in 1844, Joseph Smith and his brother were murdered and mangled by a mob in Carthage, Illinois, and the movement seemed near collapse. The falling torch was seized by the remarkable Mormon Moses named Brigham Young. Stern and austere in contrast to Smith's charm and affability, the barrel-chested Brigham Young had received only 11 days of formal schooling, but he quickly proved to be an aggressive leader, an eloquent preacher, and a gifted administrator. Determined to escape further persecution, Young, in 1846 and 47, led his oppressed and despoiled Latter-day Saints over the vast rolling plains to Utah, as they sang, Come, come, ye saints. Overcoming pioneering hardships, the Mormons soon made the desert bloom like a new Eden by means of ingenious and cooperative methods of irrigation. The crops of 1848, threatened by hordes of crickets, were saved when flocks of gulls appeared, as if by a miracle, to gulp down the invaders. A monument to the seagulls stands in Salt Lake City today. Semi-arid Utah grew remarkably. By the end of 1848, some 5,000 settlers had arrived, and other large bands were to follow them. Many dedicated Mormons in the 1850s actually made the 1,300-mile trek across the plains pulling two-wheel carts. Under the rigidly disciplined management of Brigham Young, the community became a prosperous frontier theocracy in a cooperative commonwealth. Young married as many as 27 women some of them wives in name only, and begot 56 children. The population was further swelled by thousands of immigrants from Europe, where the Mormons had established a flourishing missionary movement. A crisis developed when the Washington government was unable to control the hierarchy of Brigham Young, who had been able to be made territorial governor in 1850. A federal army marched in 1857 against the Mormons, who harassed its lines of supplies and rallied to die in the last-ditch dusty ditch, Fortunately, the quarrel was finally adjusted without serious bloodshed. The Mormons later ran afoul of the anti-polygamy laws passed by Congress in 1862 and 1882, and the unique mar marital customs delayed statehood for Utah until 1896. Free schools for a free people. Here we come. Tax-supported primary schools were scarce in the early years of the Republic. They had the odor of pauperism about them, since they existed chiefly to educate the children of the poor the so-called ragged schools. Advocates of free public education met stiff opposition. A Midwestern legislator cried that he wanted only to the simple epitaph when he died, here lies an enemy of public education. Well-to-do conservative Americans gradually saw the light. If they did not pay to educate other folks' as brats, the brats might grow up to, to be dangerous, ignorant rabble, armed with the vote. Taxation for education was an insurance premium that the wealthy paid for, the st for stability and democracy. Tax-supported public education, though miserably lagging in the slavery-cursed South, triumphed between, triumphed between 1825 and 1850. Grimy hand laborers wielded increased influence and demanded instruction for their children. Most important was the gaining of manhood suffrage for whites in Jackson's day. A free vote cried aloud for free education. A civilized nation that was both ignorant and free, declared Thomas Jefferson, never was and never will be. The famed Little Red Schoolhouse, with one room, one stove, one teacher, and often eight grades, became the shrine of American democracy. Regar regrettably, it was an imperfect shrine. Early free schools stayed open only a few months of the year. School teachers, most of them men in this era, were too often ill-trained, ill-tempered, and ill-paid. They frequently put more stress on the licking, with the hickory stick, than on the larnin'. These knights of the blackboard often boarded around in the <clears throat> community, and some knew scarcely more than their older pupils. They usually taught only the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, 
To many rugged Americans suspicious of Brook Larnon, this was enough. Reform was urgently needed. Into the breach stepped Horace Mann, a brilliant and idealistic graduate of Brown University. As secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, he campaigned effectively for more and better schoolhouses, longer school terms, higher pay for teachers, and an expanded curriculum. His influence radiated out to the other states, and an impressive improvements were all chalked up. Yet education remained an expensive luxury for many communities. As late as 1860, the nation counted only about a 100 public secondary schools and nearly a million white adult illiterates. Black slaves in the South were legally forbidden to receive instruction in reading or writing, and even free blacks in the North as well as the South were usually excluded from the schools. Educational advances were aided by improved textbooks, notably by those of Noah Webster, a Yale-educated Connecticut Yankee who was known as the schoolmaster of the Republic. His reading lessons, used by millions of children in the 19th century, were partly designed to promote patriotism. Webster devoted 20 years to his famous dictionary, published in 1828, which helped standardize the American language. Equally influential was the Ohioan William McGuffey, a teacher-preacher of rare power. His grade school readers, first published in 1830s, sold 122 million copies in the following decades. McGuffey's readers hammered home last lasting lessons in morality, patriotism, and idealism. Higher goals for higher learning. Higher education was likewise stirring. The religious zeal of the Second Great Awakening led to the planting of many small denominational liber liberal arts colleges, chiefly in the South and West. Too often they were academically anemic, established more to satisfy a local pride than genuinely to advance the cause of learning. Like their more venerable, ivy-draped brethren, the new colleges offered a narrow, tradition-bound curriculum of Latin, Greek, mathematics, and moral philosophy. On new and old campuses alike, there was little intellectual vitality and much boredom. Sound familiar? The first state-supported universities sprang up in the South, beginning with North Carolina in 1795. Federal land grants nourished the growth of state institutions of higher learning. Conspicuous among the early group was the University of Virginia, founded in 1819. It was largely the brainchild of Thomas Jefferson, who designed its beautiful architecture who, and who at times watched its construction through a telescope from his hilltop home. He dedicated the university to freedom from religions or political shackles, and modern languages and the sciences received unusual emphasis. Women's higher education was frowned upon in the early decades of the 19th century. A woman's place was believed to be in the home, and training in needlecraft seemed more important than training in algebra. In an era when the clinging vine bride was the ideal, co-education was regarded as frivolous. Prejudices also prevailed that too much learning injured the feminine brain, undermined health, and rendered a young lady unfit for marriage. The teachers of Susan B. Anthony, the future feminist, had refused to instruct her in long division. Women's schools at the secondary level began to attain some respectability in the 1820s, thanks in part to the dedicated work of Emma Willard. In 1821, she established the Troy, New York Female Seminary. Oberlin College in Ohio jolted traditionalists in 1837 when it opened its doors to women as well as men. Oberlin had already created shockwaves by admitting black students. In the same year, Mary Lyon established an outstanding women's school, Mount Holyoke Seminary, later college, in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Mossback critics scoffed that they'll be educating cows next. Adults who craved more learning satisfied their thirst for knowledge at private subscription libraries or, increasingly, at tax-supported libraries. House-to-house -house peddlers also did a lush business in, free, uh, in feeding the public appetite for culture. Traveling lecturers helped to carry learning to the masses through the Lyceum Lecture Associations, which numbered about 3,000 by 1835. The Lyceums provided platforms for speakers in such areas as science, literature, and moral philosophy. Talented talkers like Ralph Waldo Emerson journeyed thousands of miles on Lyceum circuits, casting their pearls of civilization before appreciative audience. It's just sort of like an, an 1800s TED Talk sage. <clears throat> Magazines flourished in the pre-Civil War years, but most of them withered after a short life. The North American Review, founded in 1815, was the long-lived leader of in intellectuals. Godey's Ladies' Book, founded in 1830, survived until 1898 and attained the enormous circulation for those days of 150,000. It was devoured devotedly by millions of women, many of whom read the dog-eared copies of their relatives and friends. An Age of Reform as the young republic grew, reform campaigns of all types flourished in sometimes bewildering abundance. Some reformers were simply crack-brained cranks 
but most were intelligent, inspired idealists, usually touched by the fire of evangelical religion, then licking through the pews and pulpits of American churches. The optimistic promises of the Second Great Awakening inspired countless souls to do battle against earthly evils. These modern idealists dreamed anew the old Puritan vision of a perfected society. Free from cruelty, war, intoxicating drink, discrimination, and ultimately slavery, Women were particularly prominent in these reform crusades, especially in their own struggle for suffrage. Many middle-class women, the reform campaigns, provided a unique opportunity to escape the confines of the home and enter the arena of public affairs. In part, the practical, activist Christianity of these reformers resulted from their desire to reaffirm traditional values as they plunged ever further into a world disrupted by and transformed by the turbulent forces of a market economy. Mainly middle-class descendants of pioneer farmers, they were often blissfully unaware that they were witnessing the dawn of the industrial era, which posed unprecedented problems and called for novel ideas. They either ignored the factory workers, for example, or blamed their problems on bad habits. With naive single-mindedness, reformers sometimes applied conventional virtue by refurbishing an older order, while events hurtled them towards headlong into the new. Imprisonment for debt continued to be a nightmare, through, though its extent had been exaggerated. As late as 1830, hundreds of penniless people were languishing, languishing in filthy holes, sometimes for only less than one dollar. The poor working classes were especially hard hit by this merciless practice. But as the embattled laborer won the ballot and asserted himself, state legislatures gradually abolished debtors' prisons. Criminal codes in the states were likewise being softened in accord with the more enlightened European practices. The number of capital offenses, death penalty offenses, was uh, being reduced, and brutal punishments such as whipping and branding were being slowly eliminated. A refreshing idea was taking hold that prisons <clears throat> should reform as well as punish, hence the reformeries or the House of Corrections and the penitentiaries for penance. <clears throat> Sufferers from so-called insanity were still being treated with incredible cruelty. The medieval concept had been that the mentally deranged were cursed and unclean spirits, or cursed with unclean spirits. The 19th century idea was that they were willfully perverse and depraved, to be treated only as beasts. Many crazy persons were chained in jails or poorhouses with sane people. Into this dismal picture stepped the formidable New England teacher-author Dorothea Dix. A physically frail woman afflicted with persistent lung trouble, she possessed infinite compassion and willpower. She traveled some 60,000 miles in eight years and assembled her damning reports on insanity and asylums from first-hand observations. Though she never raised her voice, Dix's message was loud and clear. Her classic petition of 1843 to the Massachusetts legislature, describing the cells so foul that visitors were driven back by the stench, turned legislative stomachs and hearts. Her persistent prodding resulted in improved conditions and in a gain for the concept that the demented were not willfully perverse but mentally ill. Agitation for peace also gained momentum in the pre-Civil War years. In 1828, the American Peace Society was formed. With a ringing declaration of war on war, a leading spirit was William Ladd, who orated when his legs were so badly ulcerated that he had to sit on a stool. His ideas were finally, finally to bear some fruit in the international organizations for collective security of the 20th century. The American Peace Crusade, linked with a European counterpart, was making promising progress by mid-century, but it was set back by the bloodshed of the Crimean War in Europe and the Civil War in America. Demon Rum, the Old Deluder. The ever-present drink problem attracted dedicated reformers. Custom, combined with a hard and monotonous life, led to the excessive drinking of hard liquor, even among women, clergymen, and members of Congress. Weddings and funerals all too often became disgraceful brawls, and occasionally a drunken mourner would fall into an open grave with the corpse. Heavy drinking decreased the efficiency of labor, and poorly safeguarded machinery operated under the influence of alcohol increased the danger of accidents occurring at work. Drunkenness was also followed the sanctity of the family, threatening the spiritual welfare and physical safety of women and children. After earlier and feebler efforts, the American Temperance Society was formed at Boston in 1826. Within a few years, about a thousand local groups sprang into existence. They implored drinkers to sign the Temperance Pledge and organize children's clubs known as the Cold Water Army. Temperance crusaders also made effective use of pictures, pamphlets, and lurid lecturers, some of them who were reformed drunkards. 
a popular temperance song ran, We've done with our days of carousing, our nights too of frolicsome glee, for now with sober minds choosing, we've pledged ourselves never to spree. That's quite a ring, doesn't it? The most popular anti-alcohol tract of the era was T.S. Author's melodramatic novel, Ten Nights in a Barroom and What I Saw There, 1854. It described in shocking detail how a once happy village was ruined by Samuel Slade's tavern. The book was second only to Stowe's ha Uncle Tom's Cabin as a bestseller in the 1850s, and it enjoyed a highly successful run on the stage. Its touching theme song began with the words of a little girl, Father, dear father, come home with me now. The clock in the belfry strikes one. Early foes of demon drink adopted two major lines of attack. One was to stiffen the individual's will to resist the wiles of the little brown jug. The moderate reformers thus stressed temperance rather than teetotalism, or the total elimination of intoxicants. But less patient zealots came to believe that temptation should be removed by legislation. Prominent among this group was Neil S. Dow of Maine, a blue-nosed reformer who, as a mayor of Portland and an employer of labor, had often witnessed the debauching effect of alcohol, to say nothing of the cost to his pocketbook on the work time lost because of drunken employees. Dow, the father of prohibition, sponsored the so-called Maine Law of 1851, this drastic new statute, held as a law of heaven Americanized, and prohibited the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquor. Other states in the North followed Maine's example, and by 1857, about a dozen had passed various prohibitory laws. But these figures are deceptive, for within a decade some of the statutes were repealed or declared unconstitutional, if not openly flouted. It was clearly impossible to legislate thirst for alcohol out of existence, especially in localities where public sentiment was hostile. Yet, on the eve of the Civil War, the Prohibitionists had registered inspiring gains. There was much less drinking among women than earlier in the century, and probably much less per capita consumption of hard liquor. <clears throat> women in Revolt When the 19th century opened, it was still a man's world, both in America and in Europe. A wife was supposed to immerse herself in her home and subordinate herself to her lord and master, her husband. Like black slaves, she could not vote. Like black slaves, she could be legally beaten uh, by her overlord with a reasonable instrument. When she married, she could not retain the title to her property. It passed to her husband. Yet American women, though legally regarded as perpetual minors, fared better than their European cousins. French visitor Alexis de Tocqueville noted that in his native France, rape was punished only lightly, whereas in America, it was one of the few crimes punishable by death. Despite these relative advantages, women were still quote, the submerged sex in America in the early part of the century. But as the decades unfolded, women increasingly surfaced to breathe the air of freedom and self-determination. In contrast to women in colonial times, many women now avoided marriage altogether. About 10% of adult women remained spinsters at the time of the Civil War. Gender differences were strongly emphasized in the 19th century America, largely because the burgeoning market economy was increasingly separating women and men into sharply distinct economic roles. Women were thought to be physically and emotionally weak, but also artistic and refined. Endowed with finely tuned moral sensibilities, they were the keepers of society's conscience, with special responsibility to teach the young how to be good and productive citizens of the Republic. Men were considered strong but crude, always in danger of slipping into some savage or beastly way of life, if not guided by the gentle hands of their lovely ladies. <laughs> Loving ladies, sorry. The home was a woman's special sphere, the centerpiece of the cult of domesticity. Even reformers like Catherine Beecher, who urged her sister to seek employment as teachers, endlessly celebrated the role of the good homemaker. But some women increasingly felt that the glorified sanctuary of the home was in fact a gilded cage. They yearned to tear down the bars that separated the private world of women from the public world of men. Clamorous female reformers, most of them white and well-to-do, began to gather strength as the century neared its halfway point. Most were broad-gauge battlers. While demanding rights for women, they joined the general reform movement of the age, fighting for temperance and the abolition of slavery. Like men, they had been touched by the evangelical spirit that offered the promise of earthly reward for human endeavor. Neither foul eggs nor foul words, words when hurled by disapproving men, could halt women heartened by these doctrines. The women's rights movement was mothered by some arresting characters. Prominent among them was Lucretia Mott, a sprightly Quaker whose ire had been roused when she and her fellow female delegates to the London Anti-Slavery Convention of 1840 were not recognized. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a mother of seven who had insisted on leaving Obey out of her marriage ceremony, shocked fellow feminists by going so far to advocate suffrage for women. 
Quaker reared Susan B. Anthony, a militant lecturer for women's rights, fearlessly exposed herself to rotten garbage and vulgar epithets. She became such a conspicuous advocate of female rights that progressive women everywhere were called Susie B's. Other feminists challenged the man's world. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, a pioneer in a previously forbidden profession for women, was the first female graduate of a medical college. Precocious Margaret Fuller edited a transcendentalist journal, The Dial, and took part in the struggle to bring unity and Republican government to Italy. She died in a shipwreck off New York's Fire Island while returning to the United States in 1850. The talented, talented Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina, championed anti-slavery. Lucy Stone retained her maiden name after marriage, hence the latter-day Lucy Stoners who followed her example. Amelia Bloomer revolted against the current street-sweeping female attire by donning a semi-masculine short skirt with Turkish trousers, bloomers they were called, amid much body ridicule about bloomerism and loose habits. <laughs> A jeering male rhyme of the times jabbed, Jibby Jibby Gab, the women had a confab, and demanded the rights to wear the tights, Jibby Jibby Jab. I love these songs back then. Fighting feminists met at Seneca Falls, New York, in a memorable women's rights convention. The defiant Stanton read a Declaration of Sentiments, which in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, declared that, quote, all men and women are created equal. One resolution formally demanded the ballot for females. Amid scorn and denunciation from press and pulpit, the Seneca Falls meeting launched the modern women's rights movement. The crusade for women's rights was eclipsed by the campaign against slavery in the decade before the Civil War. Still, any white male, even an idiot over the age of 21, could vote, while no women could vote. Yet women, women were gradually being admitted to colleges, and some states, beginning with Mississippi in 1839, were even permitting wives to own property ever after marriage. Wilderness Utopias Bolstered by the utopian spirit of the age, various reformers, ranging from the high-minded to the lunatic fringe, set up more than 40 communities of cooperative, communistic, or communitarian nature. Seeking human betterment, the wealthy and idealistic Scottish textile manufacturer Robert Owen founded in 1825 a communal society of about a thousand people at New Harmony, Indiana. Little harmony prevailed in the colony, which, in addition to hard-working visionaries, attracted a sprinkling of radicals, work-shy theorists, and outright scoundrels. The colony sank into morass of contradiction and confusion. Brook Farm in Massachusetts, comprising 200 acres of grudging soil, was started in 1841 with the brotherly and sisterly cooperation of about 20 intellectuals committed to the philosophy of transcendentalism. They prospered reasonably well until 1846, when they lost by fire a large new communal building shortly before its completion. The whole venture in plain living and high thinking then collapsed in debt. The Brook Farm experiment inspired Nathaniel Hawthorne's classic novel, The Blythdale Romance, whose main character was modeled on the feminist writer Margaret Fuller. The more radical experiment, a more radical experiment, was the Oneida community, founded in New York in 1848. They practice free love, or what they called complex marriage, birth control through male continence or coitus reservatus, and the eugenic selection of parents to produce superior offspring. This curious enterprise flourished for more than 30 years, largely because its artisans made superior steel, steel traps in Oneida community silver plate, uh, <clears throat> the silverware. Various communities, various communistic experiments, mostly small in scale, have been attempted since Jamestown, but in competition with democratic free enterprise and free land, Virtually all of them sooner or later failed or changed their methods. Amongst the longest living sects were the Shakers. Led by Mother Anne Lee, they began in the, 18, the 1770s to set up the first of a score or so of religious communities. The Shakers attained a membership of about 6,000 by 1840, but since their monastic customs prohibited both marriage and sexual relations, they were virtually extinct by 1940. The Dawn of Scientific Achievement Early Americans, confronted with pioneering problems, were more interested in practical gadgets than in pure science. Jefferson, for example, was a gifted amateur inventor who won a gold medal for a new type of plow. Noteworthy also were the writings of the mathematician Nathaniel Bowditch on practical navigation and of the oceanographer Matthew Murray uh, on ocean winds and currents. These writers promoted safety, speed, and economy. But as far as basic science was concerned, Americans were best known for borrowing and adapting the findings of Europeans. Yet the Republic was not without scientific talent. The most influential American scientist of the first half of the 19th century was Professor Benjamin Silliman, Silliman, a pioneer chemist and geologist who taught and wrote brilliantly at Yale College for more than 50 years. Professor Louis Agassiz, Agassiz 
uh, a distinguished French-Swiss immigrant, served for a quarter century at Harvard College. A path-breaking student of biology who sometimes carried snakes in his pockets, he insisted on original research and deplored the reigning overemphasis on memory work. Professor Asa Gray of Harvard College, the Columbia, Columbus of American Botany, published over 350 books, monographs, and papers. His textbooks set new standards for clarity and interest. Lovers of American bird lore owed much to the French descendant naturalist John Audubon, who, had, who painted wildfowl in their natural habitat. His magnificently illustrated Birds of America attained considerable popularity. The Audubon Society for the Protection of Birds was named after him, although as a young man, he shot much feathered game for sport. Medicine in America, despite a steadily growth of medical schools, was still primitive by modern standards. Bleeding remained a common cure and a curse as well. Smallpox plagues were still dreaded, and the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 in Philadelphia took several thousand lives. Bring out your dead was the daily cry of the corpse wagon drivers. See Monty Python for more specific details. People everywhere complained of ill health, malaria, the rheumatics, and the miseries, and the chills. Illness was often resulted from improper diet hurried eating, perspiring and cooling off too rapidly, and ignorance of germs and sanitation. We was sick every fall, regular, wrote the mother of future President James Garfield. Life expectancy was still dismayingly short, about 40 years for a white person born in 1850, and less for blacks. The suffering from decayed or ulcerated teeth was enormous. Tooth extraction was often practiced by the muscular village of blacks. Self-prescribed patent medicines were common, one dose for people, two for, two for horses, and included Robertson's infallible worm-destroying lozenges. Fad diets proved popular, including the whole wheat bread and crackers regimen of Sylvester Graham. Among home remedies was the rubbing of tumors with dead toads. The use of medicines by regular doctors was often harmful, and Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes declared in 1860 that if the medicines as then employed were thrown into the sea, humans would be better off and the fish worse off. Dr. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, by the way, he lived in Pittsfield, and there is still uh, a house called Holmeswood there, and um, there's a street called Holmes Road named after him from these local Massachusetts listeners. Victims of surgical operations were ordinarily tied down, often after a stiff whiskey. The surgeon then sawed or cut with breakneck speed, undeterred by the piercing shrieks of the patient. A priceless boon for medical progress came in the early 1840s when several American doctors and dentists, working independently, successfully employed laughing gas as ether, ether anesthetic. Artistic achievements. America contributed little of the after the century. The rust of the Republic, still under pressure to erect shelters in haste, was continuing to imitate European models. Public buildings and other important structures followed Greek and Roman lines, which seemed curiously out of place in a wilderness setting. A remarkable Greek revival came between 1820 and 1850. Partly, stimulated by the heroic efforts of the Greeks in the 1820s to wrest independence from the troubled people. About mid-century, strong interest developed in a revival of Gothic forms with an emphasis on pointed arches and large windows. Talented Thomas Jefferson, architect of the revolution, was probably the ablest American architect of his generation. He brought a classical design to his village hilltop home, Monticello, perhaps the most stately mansion in the nation. The quadrangle at the University of Virginia at Charlottesville another of Jefferson's creations, remains one of the finest examples of classical architecture in America. The art of painting continued to be handicapped. It suffered from the dollar-grabbing of, of a raw civilization, from the hustle, bustle, and absence of leisure, from the lack of a wealthy class to sit for portraits and then pay for them. Some of the earliest painters were forced to go to England, where they both found both training and patrons. America exported artists and imported art. Painting, like the theater, also suffered from the Puritan prejudice that art was a sinful waste of time and often obscene. John Adams boasted that, quote, he would not give a sixpence for a bust of Phidias or a painting of, by Raphael. When Edward Everett, the eminent Boston scholar and orator, placed a statue of Apollo in his home, he had its naked limbs, naked limbs draped. Competent painters nevertheless emerged. Gilbert Stuart, a spendthrift Rhode Islander, and one of the most gifted of the early group, wielded his brush in Britain in competition with the best artists. He produced several portraits of Washington, all of them somewhat idealized and dehumanized. Truth to tell, by the time he posed for Stuart, the famous general has lo had lost his natural teeth and some of the original shape of his face. Charles Wilson Peale, a Marylander, painted some 60 portraits of Washington, who patiently sat for about 14 of them. John Trumbull, who, is, who had fought in the Revolutionary War, recaptured its scenes and spirit on the scores of striking canvases.
During the nationalistic upsurge after the War of 1812, American painters of portraits turned increasingly from human landscapes to romantic mirroring of local landscapes. The Hudson River School excelled in this type of art. At the same time, portrait painters gradually encountered some unwelcome competition from the invention of a crude photograph known as the daguerreotype, perfected in about 1839 by a Frenchman, Louis Daguerre. Music was slowly shaking off the restraints of colonial days when the prim Puritans had frowned upon non-religious singing. Rhythmic and nostalgic darky tunes, popularized by whites, were becoming immense hits by mid-century. Special favorites were the uniquely American minstrel shows featuring white actors with blackened faces. Dixie, later adopted by the Confederates as their battle hymn, was written in 1859, ironically, in New York City, by an Ohioan. The most famous black songs also ironically came from a white Pennsylvania, Stephen C. Foster. His one excursion into the South occurred in 1852 after he had published Old Folks at Home. Foster made a valuable contribution to American folk music by capturing the plaintive spirit of the slaves. An odd and pathetic figure, he finally lost his art and his popularity and died in a charity ward after drowning his sorrows in Germany. The Blossoming of a National Literature Who reads an American book, sneered a British critic of 1820? The painful truth was that the nation's rough-hewn, pioneering civilization gave little encouragement to polite literature. Much of the reading matter was imported or plagiarized from Britain. Busy conquering a continent, the Americans poured most of their creative efforts into practical outlets. Praiseworthy were the political essays, like the Federalists of Hamilton, Jay, and Madison, pamphlets like Thomas Paine's Common Sense, and political orations like the masterpieces of Daniel Webster. In the category of non-religious books published before 1820, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is one of the few that achieved genuine distinction. His narrative is a classic in its simplicity, clarity, and inspirational quality. Even so, it records only a fragment of Old Ben's long, fruitful, and amorous life. A genuinely American literature received a strong boost from the wave of nationalism that followed the War of Independence, and especially the War of 1812. By 1820, the older seaboard areas were sufficiently removed from the survival mentality of tree chopping and butter churning so that literature could be supported by a, as a profession. The Knickerbocker Group in New York blazed brilliantly across the literary heavens, thus enabling America for the first time to boast of a literature to match its magnificent landscapes. Washington Irving, born in New York City, was the first American to win international recognition as a literary figure. Deep in the tradition of New Netherland, he published in 1809 his Knickerbocker's History of New York, with its amusing caricatures of the Dutch. When the family business failed, Irving was forced to turn to the goose feather pen. In 1819 to 1820, he published The Sketchbook, which brought him immediate fame at home and abroad. Combining a pleasing style with delicate charm and quiet humor, he used English as well as American themes and included such immoral Dutch-American tales as Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Europe was amazed to find at last an American with a feather in his hand, not in his hair. Later turning to Spanish locales and biography, Irving did much to interpret America to Europe and Europe to America. He was, said the Englishman William Thackeray, the first ambassador whom the new world of letters sent to the old. James Fenimore Cooper was the first American novelist as Washington Irving was the first general writer. He gained world fame and to make New World themes respectable. Marrying into a wealthy family, he settled down on the frontier of New York. Reading one day to his wife from an insipid English novel, Cooper remarked and discussed that he could write a better book himself. His wife challenged him to do so, and he did. After initial failure, Cooper launched out upon an illustrious career in 1821 with the second novel, I, an absorbing tale of the American Revolution. His stories of the sea were mer meritorious and popular, but his fame rests most enduringly on the leather stocking tales. A dead-eye rifleman named Natty Bumpo, one of the nature's noblemen, meets with the Indians in stirring adventures like The Last of the Mohicans. James Fenimore Cooper's novels had a wide sale among Europeans, some of whom came to think that all American people as born with a tomahawk in their hand. Actually, Cooper was exploring the viability and destiny of Americans' Republican experiment by contrasting the un undefiled values of natural men, children of the wooded wilderness, with the artificiality of modern civilization. A third member of the Knickerbocker group uh, in New York was the belated Puritan William Cullen Bryant, transplanted from Massachusetts. At 16, he wrote the meditative and melancholy Thanatos, published in 1817, which was one of the first high-quality poems produced in the United States. Critics could hardly believe that it had been written on this side of the water. Although Bryant continued with poetry, he was forced to make his living by editing the influential New York Evening Post. For over 50 years, he set a model for journalism that was dignified, liberal, and conscientious. He also 
uh, has roots in Cummington, Massachusetts. Trumpeters of Transcendentalism. A golden age in American literature dawned in the second quarter of the 19th century when an amazing outburst shook New England. One of the mainsprings of this literary flowering was the Transcendentalist, especially around Boston, which preened itself on the, as the Athens of America. Boston thinks pretty highly of itself and its academia. They still do, I think. The Transcendentalist movement of the 1830s resulted in part from a liberalizing of academic theology. It also owed much to the foreign influence, including the German Romantic philosophers and the religions of Asia. The Transcendentalists rejected the prevailing theory derived from John Locke that all knowledge comes from the mind through the senses. Truth, rather, transcends the senses. It cannot be found by observation alone. Every person possesses an inner light that can illuminate the highest truth and put him or her in direct touch with God or the Oversoul. These mystical doctrines of Transcendentalism defied precise definition, but they underlay concrete beliefs. Foremost was a stiff-backed individualism in matters religious as well as social. Closely associated was a commitment to self-reliance, self-culture, and self-discipline. These traits naturally bred hostility to authority and to formal institutions of any kind, as well as to all conventional wisdom. Finally came exaltation of the dignity of the individual, whether black or white, the mainstream, the mainspring of a whole array of humanitarian Best known of the transcendentalist was Boston-born Ralph Waldo Emerson. Tall, slender, and intensely blue-eyed, he mirrored the serenity in his noble features. Trained as a Unitarian minister, he early forsook his pulpit and ultimately reached a wider audience by pen and platform. He was a never-failing favorite as a lyceum lecturer and for 20 years took a Western tour every winter. Perhaps his most thrilling public effort was a Phi Beta Kappa address, The American Scholar, delivered at Harvard College in 1837. This brilliant appeal was an intellectual declaration of independence, for it urged American writers to throw off European tradition and delve into the riches of their own backyards. Held as both a poet and a philosopher, Emerson was not of the highest rank as either. He was more influential as a practical philosopher, and through his fresh and vibrant essays, enriched countless thousands of humdrum lives. Catching the individualistic mood of the Republic, he stressed self-reliance, self-importance, self-confidence, optimism, and freedom. The secret of Emerson's popularity lay largely in the fact that his ideals reflected those of an expanding America. By the 1850s, he was an outspoken critic of slavery, and he ardently supported the Union cause in the Civil War. Henry David Thoreau was, an Emerson's, was Emerson's close associate, a poet, a mystic, a transcendentalist, and a nonconformist. Condemning a government that supported slavery, he refused to pay his Massachusetts poll tax and was jailed for a night. A, gift pro, a gifted prose writer, he is well known for Walden, or Life in the Woods. The book is a record of Thoreau's two years of simple existence in a hut that he built on the edge of Walden Pond near Concord, Massachusetts. A stiff-necked individualist, he believed that he should reduce his bodily wants so as to gain time for pursuit of truth through study and meditation. Thoreau's Walden and his essay on the duty of civil disobedience exercised a strong influence in furthering idealistic thought, both in America and abroad. His writings later encouraged Mahatma Gandhi to resist British rule in India, and still later inspired the development of American civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr.'s thinking about nonviolence. Bold, brassy, and swaggering was the open collared figure of Brooklyn's Walt Whitman. In his famous collection of poems, Leaves of Grass, he gave free rein to his gushing genius with what he called a barbaric, a barbaric yawp. Highly romantic, emotional, and unconventional, he dispensed with titles, stanzas, rhymes, and at times even regular meter. He handled sex with shocking frankness, although he laundered his verses in later editions, and his book was banned in Boston. Whitman's Leaves of Grass was at first a financial failure. The only three enthusiastic reviews that it received were written by the author himself, anonymously. But in time, the once withered Leaves of Grass re revived and honored one for Whitman, an enormous following in both America and Europe. His fame increased immensely among Whitmaniacs after his death. Leaves of Grass gained for Whitman the informal title of Poet Laureate of Democracy. Singing with transcendental abandon of his love for the masses, he caught the exuberant enthusiasm of an expanding America that had turned its back on the old world. All the past we leave behind, we debauch upon a newer, mightier world, varied world. Fresh and strong the world we see, the world of labor and the march. Pioneers, oh pioneers. Here at last was the native art for which critics have been crying. Glowing Literary Lights Certain other literary giants were not actively associated with the Transcendental Movement, though not completely immune to its influence. 
Professor Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who for many years taught modern languages at Harvard College, was one of the most popular poets ever produced in America. Handsome and urbane, he lived a generally serene life except for the tragic deaths of two wives, the second of whom perished before his eyes when her dress caught fire. Writing for the genteel classes, he was adopted by the less cultured masses. He, <clears throat> his wide knowledge of European literature supplied him with many themes, but some of his most admired poems, the Evangeline, the Song of Hiawatha, and the Court of Miles Standish, were based on American tradition. Immensely popular in Europe, Longfellow was the only American ever to be honored with a bust in the poet's corner of Westminster Abbey. Longfellow also stayed in Pittsfield and Lennox, with local connections. A fighter, a fighting Quaker, come with, with Whittier, with, with piercing dark eyes and fashion, was the unfound poet laureate of the ancient talented as a writer than Longfellow, he was vastly more important than the influence of Western America. His poems cried aloud against inhumanity, injustice, and intolerance, against the outworn right, the old abuse, pious fraud, transparent groan. Undeterred by insults and the stoning of mobs, Whittier helped arouse a calloused America on the slavery issue. A supreme conscious rather than a sterling poet or intellect, Whittier was one of the moving forces of his generation, whether moral, humanitarian, or spiritual. Gentle, lovable, he was preeminently the poet of human freedom. Many cited Professor James Russell Lowell, who succeeded Professor Longfellow at Harvard, ranks as one of America's better poets. He was also a distinguished essayist, literary critic, editor, and a diplomat, a diffusion of talents that hampered his poetical output. Lowell is remembered as a political satirist in his Bigelow papers, especially those of 1846 dealing with the Mexican War. Written partly as poetry in the Yankee dialect, the papers condemned in blistering terms the alleged slavery expansion designs of, he, the, of the Polk administration. The scholarly Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, who taught anatomy with a sparkle at Harvard Medical School, was a prominent poet, essayist, novelist, lecturer, and wit. A nonconformist and a fascinating conversationalist, he shone among a group of literary lights who regarded Boston as the hub of the universe. His poem, The Last Leaf, in honor of the last white Indian of the Tea Party, came to apply to himself. Dying at the age of 85, he was the last leaf among his distinguished contemporaries. Two women writers whose work remains enormously popular today were also tied to this New England literary world. Louisa May Alcott grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, in the bosom of transcendentalism, alongside neighbors Emerson, Thoreau, and Fuller. Philosopher father Bronson Alcott occupied himself more devotedly to the ideas than earning a living, leading his daughter to write Little Women and other books to support her mother and sister. Not far away in Amherst, Massachusetts, poet Emily Dickinson lived a recluse, but created her lived as a recluse, but created her own original world through precious gems of poetry. In deceptively spare language and simple rhyme schemes, she explored universal themes of nature, love, death, and immortality. Although she refused during her lifetime to publish any of her poems, when she died, nearly two thousand of them were found on a paper by independence. The most noteworthy literary figure produced by the South before the Civil War, unless Edgar Allan Poe is regarded as a Southerner, was novelist William Gilmore Sim. Quantitatively, at least, he was great. Eighty-two books flowed from his ever-moist pen, winning the hymn the title of the Cooper of the South. His themes dealt with the Southern frontier in colonial days and with the South during Revolutionary War, but he was neglected by his own section, even though he married into the socially elite and became a slave owner. The high-toned planter aristocracy would never accept the son of a poor Charles Stolte. Not all writers in these years believed so keenly in human goodness and social progress. Edgar Allan Poe, who spent much of his youth in Virginia, was an eccentric genius. Orphaned at an early age, cursed with ill health, and married to a child wife of 13 who fell fatally ill of tuberculosis, he suffered hunger, cold, poverty, and death. Failing at suicide, he took refuge in the bottle and dissipated his, early ta his talent early. Poe was a gifted lyric poet, as the raven attests. A master stylist, he also excelled in the short story, especially of the horror type, in which he shared his alcoholic nightmares with fascinated readers. If he did not invent the modern detective novel, he at least set new high standards in tales like The Gold Bug. Poe was fascinated by the ghostly and the ghastly, as in The Fall of the House of Usher, and other stories. He reflected a morbid sensibility, distinctly at odds with the usual optimistic tone of American culture. Partly for this reason, Poe has perhaps been even more prized by Europeans than Americans. His brilliant career was cut short when he was found drunk in a Baltimore gutter and shortly died there. Two other writers reflected the continuing Calvinist obsession with original sin and with the never-ending struggle between good and evil. 
In somber Salem, Massachusetts, Nathaniel, writer Nathaniel Hawthorne grew up in an atmosphere heavy with memories of his Puritan forebears and the tragedy of his father's premature death on the ocean voyage. His masterpiece, The Scarlet Letter, which describes the Puritan practice of forcing adulteress to wear a scarlet A on her clothing. The tragic tale chronicles the psychological effect of sin on the guilty heroine and her secret lover, the father of her baby, a minister of the gospel in Puritan Boston. In The Marble Fawn, Hawthorne dealt with a group of young American artists who witnessed a mysterious murder in Rome. The book explores the concepts of the om omnipresent of evil and de the dead hand of the past weighing upon the present. <clears throat> Hervin Melville, <clears throat> an orphan uh, and ill-educated New Yorker, <clears throat> went to sea as a youth and served 18 adventuresome months on a whaler. A whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard, he wrote. Jumping ship in the South Seas, he lived among cannibals from whom he prov providently escaped uneaten. His fresh and charming tales of the South Seas were immediately popular. His masterpiece, Moby Dick, written in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, on Holmes Road, was not. This epic novel is a complex allegory of good and evil, told in terms of the conflict between a whaling captain, Ahab, and a giant white whale, Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, having lost a leg to the marine monster, lives only for revenge. His pursuit finally ends when Moby Dick rams and sinks Ahab's ship, leaving only one survivor. The whale's exact identity and Ahab's motives remain obscure. In the end, the sea, like the terrifying and personal an unknowable universe of Melville's imagination simply rolls on. Moby Dick was widely ignored at the time of its publication. People were accustomed to more straightforward and upbeat prose. A disheartened Melville continued to write unprofitably for some years, part of the time eking out a living as a customs inspector, and then died in relative obscurity and poverty. Ironically, his brooding masterpiece about the mysterious white whale had to wait until the more jaded 20th century for readers and for proper recognition. Portrayers of the Past. A distinguished group of American historians was emerging at the time that other writers were winning distinction. Energetic George Bancroft, who as a Secretary of the Navy helped found the Naval Academy in, at Annapolis in 1845, has deservedly received the title Father of American History. He published a spirited, super patriotic history of the United States through 1789 in six, originally ten volumes, a work that grew out of his vast researches in the dusty archives in Europe and America. Two other historians are read with greater pleasure and profit today. William H. Prescott, who accidentally lost sight of an eye while in college, conserved his remaining weak vision and published classic accounts of the conquests of Mexico and Peru. Francis Parkman, whose eyes were so defective that he wrote in darkness with the aid of a guiding machine, penned a brilliant series of volumes beginning in 1851. In epic style, he chronicled the struggle between France and Britain in colonial times for the mastery of North America. Early American historians of prominence were almost without exception New Englanders, largely because the Boston area provided well-stocked libraries and a stimulating literary tradition. These writers numbered abolitionists among their relatives and friends, and hence were disposed to view unsympathetically the slavery-cursed South. The writing of American history for generations to come was to suffer from an anti-Southern bias perpetuated by this early made-in-New England interpretation. 